Well, Friday Cell was a program that I worked on. I, I started working on it when I was with the American Cancer Society, and then we transitioned it to NCI. And so probably 10 years I worked uh, disseminating the Body and Soul program in churches. Um, so today I get to talk about my two favorite subjects, which are health ministry and health communication. Um, so what I'm going to cover is um, how churches can do, basically how you can do health communication. And we'll talk about sort of a plan approach to doing health communication in, um, in, in health ministries um, and how to make that work. Um, so when you think about the work that you have to do in your communities and your congregations, what are some of your biggest challenges in communicating health messages? So when you think about health communication, you might think of a number of different uh, ways that things that you have seen. So you might think of ads that you've seen on TV or PSAs that you've heard on the radio. You might think of posters and flyers. Um, we also talk about uh, interpersonal communication, so sort of one-on-one -on -one, um, health education type activities as a form of health communication, um, different kind of educational and entertainment things that have a health message as a form of health communication. Um, the, the, the important thing to remember about health communication is that it goes along with the other things that you do. It helps support the other initiatives. There are very few successful health communication programs that are just communication alone. But it's usually communication and education and policy, and they all work together. And just like you don't do health, health communication alone, you don't necessarily do those other things without doing communication too. Um, some people will say, oh, if you build it, they will come. We just put it in a track, people will be active. Well, no, they won't. If they don't know the track is there, if they're not motivated to use the track, um, do you need some sort of communication to people in order to get them to come and engage in your, in your activities? Think about McDonald's. Like, how long has McDonald's been around? How many billions and billions of hamburgers have they sold? Do they still advertise? Right. right. They didn't decide 20 years ago, well, people know us. We have a bunch of them around. They'll see us. They'll come in here. You have to, you have to continue to, to talk to people. People have a lot going on um, in their lives. And communication is one way that you continue to engage them, to remind them, to inspire them. And think about communication, not just to your um, church members or your community members, but think about how you co communicate with people on your coalitions. Think about how you can use communication to engage leaders, to engage policy makers. Um, these techniques work across uh, a variety of activities that you might be doing. So the definition that we use for health communication is the use of communication strategies to inform and influence individual and community decisions that enhance health. So in terms of communication strategies, there are a number of different ways that you can talk to people. So we talk about instruction, um, which is to increase people's knowledge and their skills and their awareness. Um, we talk about public relations. And what I basically, how I define public relations is Public relations is how you get other people to tell your story, how you get other people to communicate your message. So if you get a newspaper to write a story about your program, that's public relations. If you get a pastor to preach a sermon about a health topic, that's public relations. Public relations is engaging other people who have some kind of influence and who will carry your message in their own words. Um, advertising your promotions. And that's basically, hey, we're here. Uh, come do this. Go do that. You know, it's, it's how you let people know. It's how you raise awareness. Um, and then edutainment, which is a form of making instruction, making health messages fun for people. So they don't know they're getting educated. And we've seen churches do things like um, have cook-offs, uh, where the people have to use it. There's one of the churches I worked with in California did an Iron Chef cook-off with the men. And they had to use all different kinds of fruits and vegetables in the cook-off. And it was a really fun activity for the whole family and everybody came out and they got to eat lots of fruits and vegetables and they had no idea they were part of a health communication health program. The second part of this definition is informed and influence. 
So when we talk about informing people, we're talking about raising their awareness, increasing their knowledge, showing them how to do something. The thing to remember about informing people is that information alone does not lead to behavior change. Right, because we know. We know we're supposed to eat right. We know we're supposed to be active. We know we're not supposed to smoke. And we still do it anyway. So you need something else to actually get people to, be, to behave, to, to, to adopt the, the healthy behavior. The other thing to remember why this is an important point is because a lot of times when we put together health communication, we think that our only job is to inform. We think that our job is to raise awareness or increase knowledge. And that is not the goal of health communication. The goal of health communication is to get people to take action. Right? So if we go back to the commercial marketing world, it's not enough that you know about Coke, right? Coke's marketing people have not done their job if all they do, if all they've done is inform you about Coke. Their job is to get you to go buy a Coke. Um, and so when you're doing health communication, your job is to get people to take some action. Right? Does that make sense? So the second part of that is influence. So people have to know. Of course people need to know. We need to do knowledge. People, there, people don't know enough. We were just talking about um, reading labels. People need to learn to read labels. So knowledge is very important, but we also need to influence people. We need to motivate them. We need to inspire them. Um, we need to tap into the things that are meaningful and will motivate them to actually start to take action. And I think that's the thing that faith communities really bring to the table that no one else in health communication and health education can do. It's because churches and faith communities understand and can tap into and can help people link their core moral values to the decisions they make in a way that me as a health educator, I can't do. Um, but there's a way that a pastor can talk to a person. There's a way that a peer counselor in a church can talk to a person that I can't talk to, to them about what is this, what does being healthy mean? Um, what does being a good steward of your gift of health mean? And how are you gonna live out those core values? And how can you get the support you need to live out those core values? So you can talk to people and you can inspire people in a way, in a way that other forms of communication can. Um, so when we when you're thinking about doing health communication, it's not just a matter of, well, if you're physically active 30 minutes a day, most days of the week, it will help you to maintain a healthy way and it will regulate this and it will regulate that because that nobody cares about that. What people care about is, I'm going to be around for my grandchildren. I'm going to be an active member of my community. People will look up to me. I will be a role model for my family. So we really need to understand what is, what is, what is in people's hearts. And that's what we have to move in order to get people to take action. We have to be talking to them and touching them in a way that, um, that relates to something that's really meaningful to them. And then we talk about individual and community decisions. So, so like I said earlier, we're not just talking about the people that you're trying to reach, your people that are, you're trying to get to change your behavior. You may be talking to the people around them. You may be talking to their families. You may be talking to their employers. You may be talking to policy makers. Um, there are a number of factors that go into your ability to make one decision or another. And so what you're trying to do is tease out who are the people that we should really be directing our messages to, to really make it easy for the person to make a, a choice that will support their health. So you, a lot of times you'll be talking to the individual, but you might also be talking to groups, you might be talking to families, you might be engaging with communities and organizations. And you would use these same techniques with those groups that you would use in talking to individuals. Because what are groups? They're just, they're people, right? And so they're motivated by the same things that motivate everyone else. It may be a little bit different. The grandmother wants to be there for her kids. The community-based organization may have another thing that motivates them, but you're still gonna be trying to tap into that thing that motivates them to take action. So what if running a health communication program was like piloting an ocean liner? Who do you think is most important for getting the ocean liner safely to its destination? 
captain. So the navigator and all those people. Anyone else? What about these people? The people that design and build the ship. Because you know what? If they don't put the right size engines on the ship, they don't make sure the hull is watertight, the ship's not going anywhere. So all those other people are essential. Captain needs to like not run into a reef and tip the boat over and the cooks are needed there to keep the people happy and the entertainment is there to keep the need to keep the people happy and you need to keep but the ship needs to be put together properly. And all the pieces need to be in the right place at the right time um, in order for this whole thing to work. Um, to work. And you need a plan. And so it's very important if you don't plan your activities. Um, it's, it's not going to work as well. Um, and sometimes we just do things as they happen and we take the opportunities and yes, you should take the opportunities as they arise, but you need to have a plan in place um, because it's, it's very essential to putting that ship together so that everyone else that's needed to make that ship go can do their jobs effectively too. Um, so planning is very important. So what are the steps to uh, putting together a health communication plan for your program. Well, the first is you're gonna start with your vision. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? It's a broad statement of where, what you wanna see at the end of this. What do you wanna see in a year or two years or three years or five years? Or what is the vision of you're gonna, when you're gonna be out of work? What is it that's gonna put you out of work? Um, and for health ministries, that vision needs to be linked with the broader mission of the church. Because that's what helps people understand why you're there. Why did you take out the Coke machine? You need to have a good reason. You need to be, be able to explain that to people. And it needs to be something that is meaningful to them, which means that it needs to be linked to the broader mission of the church. And I think someone said earlier that you know they had um, people engaged in the, in the program, and then the, the pastor felt like the people needed to be assigned somewhere else, and so they couldn't do the program anymore. It, it, was, it, it, it may have been that the vision, that the link wasn't there. And so there were other things that were a higher priority, maybe stewardship or, um, or going out and recruiting members, but whatever your vision is, it has to be linked back to why you're there as a church. And it'll be different for every church. Um, because it needs to be based in, in whatever theology, whatever spiritual basis you have for your church. What do you want people to do? And this goes back to your vision. So we have a vision. So what is it that people need to do to actually get there? What's it going to take in order for us to achieve that vision? You're going to describe how you will achieve your goals and you are going to be specific and action-oriented. No wishy-washy objectives, right? Okay, so Moses went up on the mountain and God didn't tell Moses, tell the people to be nice to each other and be good, right? <laughs> God has specific behavioral objectives. Don't kill people, don't cheat on your wife, don't steal things, right? So you know what it is you are supposed to do you can measure your progress towards your behavior. When you're putting together your health programs and your health communication programs, you need to have behavioral objectives that are specific. Um, that way you can tell whether you are making progress towards your goal, if your program is working, because you, can, you have something that you can measure. So if your goal is to have a church garden or your goal is to make sure the seniors get their flu shots, that's something you can measure. You know that you have achieved that when you can count the number of people that got their flu shots, right? If your goal is, well, we don't want people to get sick, how are you going to measure that, right? You need something that, that has a behavior and action component to it. You want to identify who needs to change, whose behavior you want to see change. You need to be specific about what behavior you want to see change. And you need to be specific about when you want to see that change take place. And that will really help you to keep your program on track. And it'll help you to make course corrections. If things are not going the way they, they need to be going in order to achieve your goals, having this level of specificity will really help you to do that. 
It'll also help you in developing your messages. If your goal is we want people to be healthy, where are you going to tell them? There's a million different things you can tell people and they're going to get confused and they're not really going to pay attention. But if you have a specific objective, we want people to be more active, which means we would like them to go for a walk after church or we would like them to engage in more physical activity. Now you have something that you can hang a message on because you have a call to action for people. You can tell them what it is you want them to do. We need that. We need that level of, have you ever seen a commercial and at the end of the commercial, like, I have no idea what that was for or what I was supposed to do with that information, right? That's a waste of money. <laughs> like you wasted your money putting that ad on TV and nobody knows who you are or what it is you want them to do. Um, so you can be clever and you can be fun and you can be inspiring, but at the end of it, people should know, oh, they want me to go for a walk. Or, you know what, I really need to eat a salad. That, that, that is the call to action that you need to have in your messages. What do people need in order to change? When we talk about in health communication, where is our audience? Where are they? We want to start from where they are. We have to understand what's going on with them. So if we know who they are, we can figure out what their challenges are, what their day is like, who they listen to, what kinds of activities they enjoy, um, what kinds of things are meaningful to them. So if it's seniors, you know, we know where they are. We might know where they are during the day. And um, if it's mothers, we know what, we might know what's going on with mothers. If it's men, you know, it helps if you have that audience from the previous step to then be able to describe what's happening with them. Not only what their challenges are, but what the opportunities. And you would do the same for leadership, you would do the same for policy makers, you would do the same for organizations that you're trying to engage. Where are they? What are their challenges? Where are they trying to go? And how can we develop a message that's going to resonate with them, that's going to help them live out their core values and get where it is they want to go? I think that the three keys to health communication in faith communities are leadership, education, and support and inspiration. I think these are the three things that faith communities do better than anybody else. Um, you, you have a, a, a trust, the people trust the leaders within the faith community, probably more than they trust anybody else now. I, mean, I think we have a real crisis of leadership, a real uh, crisis of uh, people to trust in a lot of different venues, uh, but I think people still trust people in their community. Um, and so I think you can provide leadership uh, that helps people understand and make those connections and really inspires people to move forward and take, take the steps they need in order to, to take care of their health. You also can provide education and support. Again, churches do this better than, than a lot of other people. You really understand how to connect with people, how to teach people the information they need, and provide them the support they need to start making those changes. So it's not just a matter of, here's what you need to know, here's how you need to, how, how to do this, but how can we help you? How can we walk this path together? What can we do to support one another in moving forward and improving our health? And then inspiration. Again, people need more than the knowledge. They need something to, to inspire them to actually take action. Um, and you think about the people in your church and what's really going to motivate them, what's really going to move them, um, what's really uh, going to be meaningful to them, and how can you help them to understand the linkages between their health and their core values. And that's something that you can do that other people can't do. Um, and so that's where you, you start to look at what are the connections that we're going to make for people. Does that make sense? So then you're going to plan your work and you're going to work your plan, right? So you're going to put your plan into place and then you're going to do the tending that is necessary uh, to get you from point A to point B. Plans are not uh, necessarily set in, set in stone other than the Ten Commandments. Everybody else's plans can be changed because <laughs> uh, you need, you'll need to make course corrections along the way and just expect that. Stuff happens. Um, I was working with a church in Louisiana, Baton Rouge, right before Katrina. Things happen. 
It, you know, you can't predict that. You have to come back. You have to figure out, okay, so what do we do now? We have things that we have to take care of. Um, so think about what you're going to need, um, when you're going to need it, where it needs to go, all those uh, practicalities. We call them logistics of making your plan work. And write it down and make sure that everyone has it and everyone understands what's going to happen. Right? Identify partners to help you inside and outside of your congregation. So you have people inside the congregation that can take on a part of this work for you. Um, you have people outside of the congregation. So if you decide what kind of health communication you want to do, what your program is going to look like, you can bring in outside resources that will support that. It's another really good reason to have your vision. So you make sure that you bring in resources that are consistent with your goals and objectives, right? You don't get off track. But you also can engage the other people. So if you, your target audience is going to be the men, then you engage the men in helping you craft what that, what that campaign is going to look like. What are the messages? What are the activities? What are the needs? So you bring in people to help you. And you make the course corrections along the way. So, you know, people didn't like that time. People didn't like that activity. People loved this activity. It really resonated with people when we put this bulletin, people really enjoy the service. So you want to check and see what works really well, what doesn't seem to be working, what needs to be tweaked, um, so that you can keep your plan on track. And you want to keep track of your activities. You want to monitor what's going, what's going on. So who are you reaching? So if your goal was to reach mothers, and you had an event, and seniors showed up, means your message is not reaching your audience. That's why you need to track. So you say, hmm, what did we do? Was it the time? Was it right? Did we put the message in the wrong place? Did we have the wrong person delivering the message? Um, but keeping track of this information will help you to refine your efforts to make sure you reach the people that you are wanting to reach. So what's working well? And what should we do with that? If this is working well, should we do it more? Should we do it bigger? Should we go to other people? Um, has it worked so well that we don't need to do this anymore? We should do something else? Uh, what needs to be changed or eliminated altogether? And what else can we do? Um, so this really worked well, and we heard back from our audience that now that we've done this, it would be really great if we could do this too. Well, as long as that's going to help you reach your goals and objectives, that helps you move to the next place. But you can't find this information out if you're not paying attention, if you're not collecting the information. And it doesn't have to be things like surveys and all that kind of stuff. It can be as simple as, you know, you're talking to people, you're getting feedback from people, you're taking pictures, you're getting head counts, so you're some kind of way documenting what is going on, and you're looking at that. So it's not just we're collecting the data and it's sitting there. You're looking at that and deciding what does this mean? And what does this mean for our program? And how do we feed this back into improving our communication um, objectives? And then you come back. So it comes back to your vision. So you collect all of that information. And you go back and say, OK, so are we, make, are we making progress toward what we set out to do? Are we making a difference? Um, and where do we go now? Do we keep going in this direction? Do we make it bigger? We did a really good job with moms. Now let's do, let's work with kids. Let's work with them with the fathers. You know you, that information will help you to make those decisions about the next step. Do we do something else? Is it time to move on to another activity or add another activity? We got healthy eating under our belt. Now let's do physical activity. Now let's do weight. You know you have to decide based on what you're learning about the people that you're trying to reach. So are there any questions? OK, so here's my two cents. Some unsolicited advice <laughs> from Alexis. <laughs> what I've learned 10 years working with churches. Be a gatekeeper. You're a gatekeeper, right? So I show up, I am MCI, CEC, American Cancer Society, so what? You don't know me, right? So ask questions. And ask questions until you understand. Um, and 
make sure that what I'm bringing to the table is going to fit with what you're trying to accomplish as a health ministry. It's going to meet your goals and objectives. Because guess what? I go back to Atlanta. Right? You're still there. Um, and you have to protect your family members, your congregants. You have to maintain your credibility as a health ministry. And so it's perfectly fine to ask as many questions as you need until you're satisfied that this piece of whatever it is I'm trying to bring or trying to work with you on is going to fit your needs. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions um, and ask a lot of questions. It doesn't offend me. I expect it. I have been sent back, sent back home and told to come back the next day, and that's what I do. I come back with the information that is requested. That's my job. It doesn't offend me. It doesn't upset me. I, I expect people to do that. I know, I understand that it's a process. And when I work with coalitions and when I train people, health educators to work with faith communities, it's one of the things I train them. Is that you have to work with people until they understand you have to understand the level of what you're asking of them. And so you have to be prepared to give them the information you need. And I also tell people that, um, that are wanting to work with the faith community, this same advice applies to you too. You need to ask questions. You need to understand the community, the faith community. You need to understand their needs. You need to understand their values, where they're coming from. Um, one thing I tell them is, for instance, you never turn down a church tour. Because that's a way for people to help you understand who they are and where they're coming from. And so if they offer you a tour of your church, you take it. And I've been on more than one tour of the same church, and I have loved every second and third tour that I've gotten because I've learned more. And it's helped me become more of a partner with that faith community. So we all need to talk. We all need to communicate. Um, and we need to make sure that we're asking the right questions and that we're asking enough questions until we're satisfied that this is going to be a win-win collaboration. Share the workload. When we talk about um, the talented 10, <laughs> like 10 people in the church that do all the work. <laughs> so you go to a pastor and ask the pastor to assign someone to work with you as a church coordinator, and this is the person that's also assigned to work on seven, eight other projects. Um, and it's because they know what they're doing and they're really good at their jobs, but they need to share the workload. Um, and especially when you're talking about something like health communication, you need to engage the people you're trying to reach. So if you're trying to reach the youth, you can't come up with a health communication program for you. Right? You need the youth to do that. So you need to bring them in you need to sort of give them the information they need to understand what it is, the behavior, and let them come up with the campaign. Let them run the campaign. Um, the same with the men or the women or the seniors. Share the work. It not only will reduce the burden uh, on you because you have nine or ten other things that you have to do, but it makes your campaign better because those people know what kind of messages are going to work for them, maybe better than you do. So share the workload. Evaluate and document. It goes back to tracking. Um, it goes back to making sure your work is working, that you're reaching your goals, that you're working towards your goals, um, and that you have some record of what happened. As I have worked with so many wonderful church coordinators, and it's all in their head. And they need to write it down, or put it in a scrapbook, or put it in a file somewhere so that the next person or other people can come and learn from what they have learned and do what they have done. So it needs to be written down somewhere um, so that they, so that uh, so that other people can benefit, right? So you have so you don't repeat mistakes, and so that you do things that work well, you can do them over again. And then this is one that someone um, that I learned last just last week actually think outside the box, act inside the golden rule. So you have a lot of things. You have a lot of programs. Those programs don't necessarily have to look like what they look in, like in the box, right? You know your community. So you make that resource work for your community. You know what's going to work for them. And you work with your partners to make that program fit the needs of the people you are trying to reach. 
Um, and it's okay to adapt that. So think outside of those toolboxes that you come with. Um, but remember that there are things, especially if you're talking about evidence-based programs that made them effective. So you want to make sure that you're consistent with what made them effective. So the program I worked on, um, we had identified a number of essential elements like pastoral leadership and church-wide activities and policy change and peer counseling. Those were the things that made our program effective. Within those four things, the churches could do whatever they wanted. As long as those elements were in place, they had the freedom to, to be creative and to create programs that were gonna, that were gonna be meaningful to, people, to the people that they were trying to reach. Um, so you, need, you, you know, don't be afraid to adapt health campaigns, health messages to meet the people, to reach the people you're gonna work with. And then for people that are in coalitions that are wanting to work with churches, don't be afraid to go outside of the box. Don't be afraid that they, the people at the church know how to talk to the people in their church. So let them do that. Um, and, but always act inside the golden room. It's a family. The churches are families. Um, and so they need to be respectful of each other. They need to sort of don't do anything to people that you wouldn't do to your own family. And so that's how you kind of, that's how you have to approach working with churches. It's within that golden rule. No, don't ask something of a church that you wouldn't ask of your own church. Could you repeat those four things again? Um, okay, so the four pillars of body and soul were pastoral leadership, church-wide activities, uh, peer counseling, we use motivational interviewing, and uh, policy, church policy. So they made policies like they took out the pop machines, they served healthy meals, um, they served the kids. And when they had snacks for kids, they always made they made a policy that the snack had to include fruit, something like that. There were a number of different policies that the churches came up with. Any other questions? So this is what I have up in my office, my last piece of unsolicited advice. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. So at the end of the day, when I'm working on a campaign, when I'm putting together a, a training, I do a lot of training, I do a lot of education, I think, has what, I put together, taught people to build a boat. Is that all I've done? It's taught people how to build a boat. So who cares? If you don't really want to go sailing, then I know how to build a boat. Have I done anything that makes people want to get in that boat and go sailing? And what do I, because that's really what's gonna get people to change their behavior. What have I done to teach them to yearn for the vast and endless? And if that's not in a part of my efforts, then I'm not done. I have to keep working on it, right? So when you're thinking about putting together and your health communication campaigns or your health programs or whatever it is you're working on, there's a lot of information. And there's a lot of things that people need to know. And they need to know about their blood pressure and their lipids and their sugar. They need to know about physical activity. They need to know about reading labels to know about how to quit smoking, they need to know about immunization. There's a lot of things. We have five, 10,000 people, 5,000 people at CDC all working on all the things people need to know in order to be safe and healthy. Um, but what does it matter, right? You have to tap into that thing that's gonna be meaningful, that's gonna resonate with people. And that is something that you all can do. You know, you really can. I, when I first started working with um, Body and Soul, one of my first church coordinators, We Street Baptist Church in Atlanta, said to me at our first meeting, she said, I don't know why my pastor picked me for this program. She said, I was a seamstress at Lord Taylor for 30 years. I don't know anything about health. So I'm not even sure why I'm here. 
is a program to promote fruits and vegetable consumption to reduce the risk for cancer. And guess what? I almost never talk about cancer. But anyway, I told her, you don't need to know the health information. I know the health information. I have a warehouse full of stuff about preventing cancer, about fruits and vegetables. I, you know, don't worry about that. You don't need that content. But why you're here is because you know how to talk to the people. You know how to reach the people. You know what's going to work in your church. That's why you're here. I will give you whatever content you need. Um, what the reason you're here is because you are going to make it work. And she had one of the most successful of the vitamin cell programs um, when we were in our pilot phase. Her church was one of the reasons they decided to move forward with the nationwide dissemination because they were so successful in doing all of the components of engaging everyone in the church, of doing really real policy change. She did training for her um, kitchen. She had a kitchen ministry. They brought in people to train them to, to, um, to, to prepare healthier foods. She said that she was looking around at a meal, a repast that they prepared after the funeral. And she decided that they were not going to come back to the church after a funeral and feed people the same food that just put that person in the ground anymore. And she made that change. That's what I need. I don't need you to be health experts. I have health experts. <laughs> I have all kinds of health experts. <laughs> um, what I need are people that see, can see where the problem is, can see where the issue is, can figure out how to fix it, and I will give you the content to make it work, okay? So here are my Here's why National Diabetes Education Program. Um, our goal is to prevent or delay the onset of diabetes. Um, we have a number of materials on diabetes prevention as well as diabetes control. Um, our strategies, I said I have health professionals and doctors all day long, uh, are based on clinical trials and epidemiological studies. We also do evaluations of community interventions. Um, and they're also based on communication and health education science. So all of our materials are tested um, and evaluated and based on the latest state of the thinking, best practices in terms of diabetes prevention and control. We develop materials for consumers in 15 different languages um, around diabetes prevention and diabetes management. We have materials for young people, teenagers, we have materials for adults, seniors, we do low literacy materials as well. We have also started to do videos for people that don't want to read at all. And we provide resources for lay uh, professionals and lay health workers. So we have toolkits on prevention. Um, we have uh, toolkits for doctors on prevention and also management. Um, we have toolkits for community-based workers on putting together diabetes programs. We have lots of resources um, for that level. Um, and we also do awareness campaigns. So we can provide a number of campaign materials, fact sheets. We have articles that you could just take our articles. All of our stuff is in the public domain, so there are no copyright restrictions. It's no cost. Or, like I like, or as I like to say, your taxes are already paid for it, so we're not going to charge you again. Um, so. <laughs> So we have, um, so use it, right? You pay for it, so <laughs> come use our stuff. Um, so we have articles that you can take and drop into your newsletters or your bulletins or whatever. We also have PSAs, we have print, um, radio, and television PSAs. We also provide the scripts for those. So if you don't want to use our radio PSA, you can get the script and you have the people in your own community read it. Um, our diabetes management campaign, Diabetes is Hard, those are the black and white posters that you see. What a lot of communities have done is instead of, and these are people that have diabetes, is instead of using the photographs and the stories we provide, they'll switch out the pictures for people in their own community or their own church and talk about the, how the people in their own church or their own community are managing diabetes. You can do that. Um, it, we will give you the files that to do that. So you can adapt our materials, you can put your logo on them, uh, you know, just just let us know uh, what you want to do.
the day. So all of our materials, our campaign materials, have already been tested, and a lot of that sort of messaging work has already gone on. And so with a little, a few little tweaks, you can make it work for your community, or make it work for your church. So this is how you get more information. You can go to our website, um, and everything is up there. Everything is electronic. If you want to download it and copy it, you can also order materials. There are ordering restrictions from our website. So if you're working with a coalition or you're working with a church and you need bulk copies, you need to contact me. And we will get you bulk copies from CDC um, because we do stock some of, that, some of the materials for that purpose at CDC. Um, are there any questions? So when we first started out, we were, did a lot of work, of work with coalitions and people in public health and health education to go into church. And we did a lot of training of them to help them understand how things work in churches and how to behave <laughs> in the church, how to engage the people in the faith community, how you, how, what the process is. Because, you know, they like call up somebody. And it's, that's not the process, right? You need to start with the pastor. Um, you need to follow the formal processes for working with the faith community. So we did a lot of that work so that they could actually understand how to engage churches in help programs. Um, and then we looked at, now how do you start to bring them into coalitions? Um, how do you uh, engage them in, in these networks that are going on? Um, so I think a lot, since that time, a lot more churches are more aware. And everybody now seems to be knocking at the doors of churches. So, you know, you again, it goes back to having your goals and objectives. You need to make sure that the people you partner with are consistent what you're trying to achieve, and you can look around and see what kind of coalitions you would you would like to be a part of. So I think it goes both ways. Um, I think that there was a lot of people at the churches didn't really know where they could get information. Um, I got, early on, I had a lot of questions like, well, how much do we have to pay a speaker? And I kept saying, you don't, you shouldn't have to pay speakers to come talk to you about cancer prevention. Now go to your health department, go to your American Cancer Society, go to uh, your hospitals. You should have people that want to come talk to you about cancer and are not going to charge you. But that information was not in the church. Um, and so we've done a lot of, we've tried to do, to do a lot of work of making people more aware of the resources that already exist in the community that you don't have to pay for, but their quality, their, um, their basic science, and they're based on what's effective. Yeah, you know, you all know how to do this. You know, you've been doing it in other areas. And so it's a matter of taking the lessons learned that you've learned from stewardship campaigns or recruiting new member campaigns and applying them to help. Right? You have a basic framework that in the, in, for what works with communication in your church. And it's just a matter of looking at, okay, now how do we apply this to help? It doesn't have to be sort of a different thing because it's health. But you don't feel like, oh, we gotta talk to people about, you know, their blood glucose now because we're doing health. No, not necessarily. They can get that information from their doctor. So what can they get from you that they can't get from their doctor? What is it that you can tell them that their doctor can't tell them about their health and protecting their health and taking care of their health? And how do you apply what you learn in other areas of um, communicating about faith and spirituality and the work of the church that you can apply to to talking to people about their health. Yeah? Are there any other questions?